Hello, everybody. Welcome. No, I'm not Alice Waters. You can save the applause, but thank you. That was pretty good. Um, welcome to the Athenaeum Theatre. Uh, although secretly tonight, it's the Wheeler Centre in partnership with Good Food Month presented by City. If you're wondering who I am, I'm Nina Russo. I edit The Age Epicure. And it's my absolute delight to introduce to you guys tonight Stephanie Alexander, who needs no introduction, who will then introduce Alice Waters. You can clap now. And then after Alice talks, we'll have, Alice and I will have a little Q&A and then there'll be chance afterwards for you guys to all ask some questions uh, if you want to do that. And then after that, there'll be books for cooks and we can do a bit of book signing with Alice. So we're, just sit back, enjoy yourselves. Oh, there's three layers. Excellent, very good looking crowd. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Stephanie Alexander. Thanks very much. Hi. Well, that's a lovely audience. I'm so delighted to have the opportunity to introduce Alice this evening. There have been so many invitations to her, but we've only now succeeded in enticing her to our faraway land. <clears throat> I think almost certainly everyone here tonight will know of Alice's restaurant in Berkeley, California, Chez Panisse, where she established new directions and sensibilities in food, first of all in California, and from there, all over the English-speaking world and probably beyond. There is no chef that I know who hasn't read with drooling her words and her recipes in her many books. I have been fortunate to visit Chez Panisse several times, and each time I found all of my senses engaged. Beautiful food exquisite still life of flowers and things from the garden, intelligent and friendly surface, sensational graphics, and, did I say, delicious, well-cooked food. And most of us will have at least one of Alice's marvellous books. <clears throat> and if you haven't, you should get one tonight. Alice is also Vice President of Slow Food, an organisation dedicated to engaging more people and governments to pursue policies that will deliver food that is good, clean and fair. Alice comes to Australia direct from the biennial slow food gathering of farmers and producers at Terra Madre in Torino, where she spoke about her hopes for the future. I joined her on a similar panel two years ago in Torino, so the conversation is still going on. She is well known as the instigator of the Edible Schoolyard, also in Berkeley at the King Middle School, and is the founder and driving force of the Edible Schoolyard Foundation, which I'm sure she will be speaking about tonight. Alice and I share a belief in the importance of introducing enjoyable food education to our young people. My own work with the Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Garden Foundation <clears throat> now operating in 750 Australian primary schools, was, the <laughs> was directly inspired 13 years ago by reading about Alice's work and by visiting the Edible Schoolyard myself. Today I have had the enormous pleasure of taking Alice on a tour of three of our Melbourne Kitchen Garden programs, Whitehorse Primary School, Collingwood College, and our lunch was prepared at the third school by the students at West Garth Primary School. I was so proud of our students and of all the staff at the schools we visited. It was an absolute knockout. Alice and I both believe that the best chance for change is to influence children's habits at school. We both have our dreams. It needs to be said that there are important differences in the situations on the ground in our country, countries. Australia has no tradition of providing free school lunches 
although we have widespread free or low-cost breakfast programs. Students bring lunch from home or they purchase lunch from a school canteen. I'm sure the many parents in this audience know all about this. Other than the prep in the earliest years, lunches are rarely eaten inside. They are eaten outside in the school grounds, under a tree, on a bench with friends, or in a special spot in the playground. Our school canteens are encouraged to follow guidelines established by the National Health and Medical Research Council. Canteens in schools are variously managed by a local body or by a parent group or outsourced to a commercial operator. They vary widely as to choice of foods, quality and charm. <coughs> Victoria's Healthy Canteen Kit divides foods into everyday, green, select carefully, amber, and occasionally, red. These absolute categories, although well-intentioned, do make me very nervous with the total absence of any attention to freshness or flavour. But we do have one significant advance. In 2006, Victoria banned soft drinks from school premises. I'm not here to say that every single school in the entire state adheres to this, but they are technically banned from school premises. I know that Alice hopes for far more than this for her delicious revolution, and I am looking forward to listening to her. The Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Garden Foundation wants to be counted as one of the Edible Schoolyard Project's Partners for Change, participating in the global food revolution, and we will continue to work for its future in this country. Please welcome one of the world's great educators and change makers, Alice Waters. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for that uh, beautiful introduction. <laughs> I'm going to make a case. I'm going to make a case for you tonight. It's, you know, it's really thrilling to be in Australia and especially here in Melbourne. Last week, I spoke at the Opera House in Sydney and uh, I heard about their festival uh, of dangerous ideas that provocative name. And I think um, I really feel part of it because I'm going to be sharing some dangerous ideas of my own tonight. Well, I've been invited to come to Australia for probably 25 years. And for one reason or another, I've never been able to find the right moment. But earlier this year, I realized that now was the moment. For the past 10 years, I've been focused intently on what is happening in the United States and to a lesser extent in Europe. However, I've come to realize that we are pieces of the same puzzle. And action in the United States has a reaction in Brazil or Mexico. The choices we make in supermarkets in London have a consequence in Kenya. And the trade decisions just made between Beijing and Canberra will have a huge global impact. We are living in a truly globalized world. Now it was the French philosopher Briot Savarin who said, the fate of nations depends on how they nourish themselves. But if he had lived at this moment in time, I'm sure he would alter the, that idea to the fate of the planet depends on how we nourish each other. When I heard that climate change was taken off the agenda at the G20 in Brisbane, I must admit, it shocked me. Perhaps I was not paying enough attention. 
But I've always thought of Australia as a place where the environment is so precious and the climate so precarious that you would be our natural leaders. As a Californian and someone with relationships with hundreds of farmers going through the worst drought imaginable, I was alarmed that something so real and so urgent as global warming could be put aside. But I noted that it was 42 degrees in Brisbane this weekend. And all I can say is, uh, I hope they were sweating in their suits. Now, I know about the extraordinary ingenuity of Australian permaculture. In many ways, we are looking to you to figure out what we might do in the future to feed ourselves. It seems uh, to me that like the food industry in the United States, the mining industry here is doing the same, pulling the wool over our eyes. This means that Australia is playing an outsized role in destabilizing the climate and making agriculture increasingly impossible, not just here, but all around the world. But I know I have very many kindred spirits right here, and I have met wonderful Australians who are engaged in the ideas that I hold so dear. People in film, like Kate Blanchett and Hugh Jackman. Do you know he just came to Berkeley to visit the Edible Schoolyard? And then, of course, uh, sadly, I wasn't there. <laughs> but, of course, there are many friends in food, like Kylie Kwong, Maggie Beer, Neil Perry, Sky in London, and new friends like Sean Moran and Rodney Dunn in Tasmania. Uh, fortunately, David Pryor, my, my brilliant collaborator and food writer, properly introduced me to Stephanie Alexander. And I regard her as a powerful ally in edible education and whose vital work with the Kitchen Garden Foundation must continue to be supported by politicians. Or David says that we're going to come and confiscate all their copies of The Cook's Companion. <laughs> so what I want to talk to you about tonight is something that I've been talking a lot about lately in lots of different places around this country and around the world. And though it's not about food and cooking in the usual sense, it's really about them in a much larger sense. I think we can all agree that we face very serious issues in the world today. Obesity and diabetes, addictions, depression, pesticide use, GMO foods, the economy, land use, water use, fair wages for workers, violence, terrorism, poverty and childhood hunger, the overarching fear of climate change, and the list goes on. It's overwhelming. In my opinion, all of these dreadful issues we face, and they are dreadful, each and every one of them, all of these issues are really outgrowths of a much bigger, more encompassing thing. They're consequences of a more fundamental and deeply rooted condition which provides the soil, if you will, for all of these other issues to grow out of. And by not addressing this deeper, larger, more pervasive condition, what we're trying to do with all our well-intentioned attempts, all of those attempts to solve these problems, is merely to treat the symptoms of a disease without dealing with the root causes of the disease itself. And unless we deal with this deeper, more insidious systemic condition, 
all of our problems won't ever really go away. They'll just come back like weeds you pulled from your garden one year and they return the next. So what is this deep systemic condition? The author Eric Schlosser, one of my personal heroes and one of the great muckrakers of our times, has pointed out that in the United States, we live in fast food nation. Fast food is, sad to say, the way people eat in the United States. I'm sure I don't need to tell any of you this. But what I'm not sure you realize, and it's something that I've just come to realize myself over the last decade or so, is that fast food is not only about food. It's bigger than that. It's way bigger. It's about culture. Fast food not only affects our diets, it also affects our rituals, our traditions, our behaviors, our relationships, expressions, laws, ways of working, systems, and ways of doing things. The effect of fast food doesn't just happen in chain restaurants along freeways or in malls or in airports. It permeates everything from the way we look at the world to how we operate in it, to how we see ourselves, to how we express ourselves, to the ways we do business, to our architecture, our entertainment, our journalism, to how we treat each other, how we interact with each other, or in many cases these days, don't interact with each other. The clothes we wear, what we buy and sell, our parks, our schools, our politics, and the list goes on. Fast food culture has become the dominant culture in the United States. And I worry that it's the dominant culture of the world. This is the bigger condition, the soil that I feel all of these other problems grow out of, fast food culture. You see, like all cultures, fast food culture has its own set of values, what I call fast food values. And these values saturate our ways of thinking and doing things so thoroughly in my mind that I don't think we see them anymore. They're just part of our makeup, part of the landscape, part of our biology at this point, I fear, part of our daily lives. And they completely degrade our human experience. Now, an example of a fast food culture value is uniformity. The idea that everything should be the same wherever you go. You know, the hamburger you get in Brisbane should look exactly like the one you get in Brooklyn. The t-shirt you buy in Los Angeles should it match exactly the one you get in Hong Kong, or there's something wrong with it. We take this value for granted. We actually like it. It thrills us. It's modern. It comforts us. But like all fast food values, uniformity masks darker issues. In this case, I would say, the pressure to conform, the loss of individuality, or the respect for uniqueness, even prejudice and control. All eggs should look the same. All houses should look alike. Everyone should behave in a certain way, or there's something wrong with them. Speed. Speed is another fast food value. Things should happen really fast. The faster, the better. I have to confess, this is me. You order it, you should get it. You want it, you should have it. Right then, no waiting. The faster something's done, the better. But when we live like this, I fear that not only do our expectations become warped, but we also become easily distractible. We lose the sense that things take time, that the best things take time. 
like growing food or cooking or learning or growing a business or getting to know someone. These days, if there's not instant satis- uh, gratification, we get frustrated. There's no maturity, no time for reflection, no patience. The faster it's delivered, the faster it's communicated, the more valuable. Time is money. How many cows can you slaughter in the slaughterhouse in a day? How many patients can you see in an hour? How fast can you eat lunch? Availability. That's another fast food value. The idea that we should be able to get anything we want wherever we are 24-7. You should be able to get a tomato in Switzerland in the middle of winter. You should be able to get Avion water in Nairobi. You should be able to get mangoes in Australia in July. Oops, asparagus. That's what it is, asparagus in July in Australia. I forgot, summer and winter. You should have cell phone service wherever you go. I know I fall victim to that one. This twisted idea of availability to me not only spoils people, but causes them to lose track of where they are in time and space. Seasons stop mattering. What's indigenous to certain places becomes unclear, maybe even irrelevant. And there's always a feeling that there's something better over there. Local culture and the specialness of what's happening here and now becomes less important than the big homogenized fast food, get anything you want global reality, or in my view, unreality. Being present to what's going on around you is devalued. I mean, just look at how many people these days are looking at their smartphones while they walk down the street. I'm not even sure they're aware of where they are. How many of you are checking your smartphones right now? (laughs) Or did you have to check them at the door? Well, you've probably been getting, been getting sponsored posts from McDonald's or Starbucks in your Instagram feed, like I did the other day, if you can imagine that. Cheapness. Now, this one drives me crazy. In the United States, there's a complete mixing up of the idea of affordability with cheapness. There's a deep feeling that value is connected to bargains. No one understands the real cost of things anymore because one, nobody tells them. And two, everything is priced artificially, supported by subsidies and corporate sleight of hand and credit. I'm sure a lot of you farmers out there can relate to this. Because I believe in paying people for the real cost of their work and their products, people say that I'm artificially driving up the prices of food in markets. And I say it's the discounted prices that are artificial. I feel like it's my responsibility to pay for the true cost of things if I can. I saw on the way to the airport that slogan of the biggest supermarket here is down, down, prices are down. That doesn't mean that their profits are down. Only what they are paying the farmers is down. That's the truth. That's the truth. Well, there was a great op-ed in the New York Times recently about this, and I don't know whether any of you saw it. A small organic farmer described quite eloquently how he and many other farmers he knows need to work one or two extra jobs just to keep their farms going. He said it was a myth that small farms were making it. Well, I don't know whether this would be a myth 
if farmers were paid appropriately for the beautiful food that they provide for us. We need to support the real fresh food people and not the supermarkets that co-opt their values. The truth is, and it's something we all need to learn, things can be affordable, but they can never be cheap. When I hear someone say, oh, I just got it cheaper here, and I feel intuitively that someone somewhere is being sold out. You cannot not pay for something here without someone over there not getting what they deserve. And you cannot not pay for something here and not expect to have problems in your life over there. Like with the environment or with your health or international relations or climate change policy for that matter. In the end, all of these deals cost us much, much more, all of us. And I think we know this deep down. Now, there are many other fast food values, and I'm sure you can identify some yourself. Like I say, they're invisible at first, but once you start to notice them, they're everywhere. It's quite shocking. Work is drudgery. That's one. Many of us accept this as natural. I assure you, work doesn't have to be drudgery unless you're in a system created and supported by a fast food culture. Work, in my mind, though difficult at times, should actually provide a sense of value and accomplishment and a sense of purpose and satisfaction a certain kind of pleasure. Fast food culture, by its very nature and for its very survival, strips work of these possibilities. It makes us all believe that work should be something degrading and meaningless and hollow, a job, just something to get through to make money. A job, just a job to make money. Well, fast food culture bleeds us of our humanity as we work within it. And sadly, as we work inside fast food culture, we inadvertently strengthen it. And what really gets to me is after that, after convincing us that work is drudgery, fast food culture then provides us with the pleasures to fill the emptiness this dissatisfied work life has left in us. Pleasures like, well, fast food for one, and video games and TV and hours on Facebook and alcohol and drugs and, and things that I like to call consumption vacations, where people just go and gorge themselves to make themselves feel good. Basically, the way I see it is fast food culture separates work and pleasure for us, and then it profits from the separation. More is better. That's another fast food value. The more you pile on your plate, the happier you'll be. The more massive the store, the better. The more apps you have, the more connected, and fulfilled. Basically, the more you have or the more choices you're offered, the better. I find this value so strange because to me, when I get too much stuff or have too many choices, I just get overwhelmed and I feel really burdened by it. There's no room for discernment. There's just volume and weight. At Chez Panisse, we used to be criticized for having only one menu. But it was the only way I could simplify things and guide people towards what I wanted them to taste and to feel and to know. And now people look forward to the one menu so they can focus on tasting something they might not have chosen for themselves, something that surprises them or delights them. 
Well, I heard an interesting thing last year. There's this chain of restaurants in both the U.S. and England. And in England, they charge the same price for half portions, half the portion, okay, of what they serve in the United States. Now, I don't know what the moral is exactly, but I don't think it's more is better. As you know, we have an obesity epidemic in the United States, and I think it's intimately connected to this idea of more is better. It's a physical manifestation of it. Some fast food values can be more abstract and elusive, like terminology and how it's used or misused and the confusion around it. I mean... What does organic mean these days? Natural, for that matter. What does local mean? Or fair trade, free range. It seems the definitions of these terms have been hijacked, and they seem to fluctuate and have more to do with marketing and presentation than attempts to clarify and inform. And what's scarier is how fast these terms get hijacked. In the food world, we find a new term that works for us like sustainable, and it gets grabbed immediately by fast food culture, and it's used everywhere indiscriminately, and in no time, the term becomes cloudy, misleading, if not meaningless. And there are so many other slippery terms that I'm aware of. How about... Australian made. Behind this issue of terminology is the issue of standards. What standards are we really using and where did they come from? It seems there seem to be standards, but they don't mean anything. Or worse, they reduce standards. Or food companies who lobby to get chemicals considered natural ingredients in their products. In other cases, it seems to me, we're too willing to compromise or to change our standards or abandon them altogether. We serve a a filtered water at Chez Panisse mainly because we found that what the government considers safe, we're not so sure about. And take the term grass-fed. You can use that term in the United States even though animals that you're talking about have only been grass-fed for just a few weeks of their lives. So in many cases, it's kind of a lie. Another fast food value, dishonesty. Perhaps that's the biggest one of all. I saw a bumper sticker once once upon a time, and it said, if we are what we eat, then I'm fast, cheap, and easy. (laughs) Well, I don't think I can say it any better than that. (laughs) Now, the reason these values are so important to me is that values shape our behavior. So if the culture around us is glamorizing and promoting values that dehumanize us, then we'll all naturally are going to act in ways that dehumanize us. And if we act in ways that dehumanize us, all the problems that I was talking about at the beginning of this talk can't help but occur. I recently saw a movie about the life of the revolutionary farm worker, Cesar Chavez, and I was so struck, well, by many things. But the thing that struck me the most was how brave Cesar Chavez and his fellow activist farm workers were. They saw something wrong, they felt the injustice of it, and then they started to articulate it, and to protest. And they were met with such massive resistance, threats to their livelihoods and lives. And they stayed strong, committed to what they felt. 
And they marched across those fields in California and they fought for what they knew was morally right. And look what happened. The birth of the modern farm worker movement in the United States. And there's still so much more work to be done for workers' rights. But Cesar Chavez and his colleagues were really holding the line at an important time. And it's a lesson to us all. It shows us what's possible in the face of seemingly overwhelming odds. And yes, and yes, there is a fast food culture, and yes, it permeates every aspect of our lives. But fortunately, there's a counterforce to this, an antidote, and I call it, no surprise, slow food culture. Slow food culture is not as flashy or as aggressive as fast food culture but it's just as enticing. It's a richer, deeper, life-affirming, fulfilling culture, one with customs and practices cultivated over centuries, really since the beginning of civilization. It's a culture connected to nature, one that organizes itself instinctively around nature's cycles and patterns and lessons. It's a universal culture, so to speak. We've just left it behind. And slow food culture, like fast food culture, has its own set of values. What I call, again, no surprise, slow food values. Now, slow food values are basically affirmative human values. You know them. Ripeness. Aliveness. Beauty, awareness, interconnectedness, patience, integrity, community, friendship, honesty, respect. These are civilized, earthbound values, and they grow out of intimate, centrally ed- uh, engaged activities. Through them, We connect to and we aspire to a life and culture that is naturally nurturing, joyful, and I think truly sustainable. Slow food values are the things that actually guide us to behave in ways that make our lives pleasurable and meaningful. Fast food values are alien to our beings. They're foisted upon us from the outside, starting in preschool, with the help of advertising and indoctrination. And they're everywhere. They're on our televisions, along the freeways, in our airports, in our homes. But thankfully, thankfully, slow food values are intrinsic to us. We're born with them. They're part of our biological makeup, at the core of our very essence. They've just been covered up, deadened by the assault of the fast food culture around us. And they're just waiting to be awakened and stimulated. It just takes a spark, a taste of a ripe mango. Here it is, that mango in December. Or gazing at a night sky full of stars. Even the smile on someone's face you've helped. Or the feeling of a child sitting on your lap when you're reading to them. Once you've awakened them, slow food values grow inside you. They become alive in you. And your perspective begins to shift. Your behavior unconsciously changes. And because of that, Your existence brightens in new, almost lively ways without effort. I always like to say it's like falling in love. That used to be easy, remember? Well, my journey at Chez Panisse is a good example of how awakening slow food values can change things. And I'm really sorry to use Chez Panisse as the example, but it's the only one I know really, really well. 
So when we started the restaurant back in 1971, we weren't really start, trying to start a revolution. Well, maybe a little bit. But what we were trying to do was to recreate a way of life that I'd experienced in France as a student. And that's how we lucked out. France, France at that time, if this was in the early 60s, France was a slow food culture. French people lived in a different way, moving in different rhythms, focused on different values. So by trying to recreate this European cafe life, we at Chez Panisse, without really thinking about it, naturally express slow food values in every decision we made. And I'm not talking about monumental decisions here. I'm talking about what kind of chair should we get for the dining room? One that reflects craftsmanship and beauty or plastic chairs that reek of uniformity and mass production? Let's get mismatched antique silverware at the flea market, which, by the way, was much more affordable and beautiful instead of the industrial restaurant supply flatware. And let's put freshly picked flowers on the tables every day to remind us what season we're in. And let's really consider the music we have playing in the background so that it brings people alive and doesn't drown out their conversation. And these very small personal decisions were like magic because, like I said, they had slow food values embedded in them. The same thing happened in the kitchen. We started cooking over fire and foraging for food in the nearby hills and connecting with the local organic farmers, pulling oysters out of the water that day and serving them because that's the way that they had done it in France. Now these values changed us and our world as we practiced them. The cumulative effect was almost predestined to become the broad culture that is Chez Panisse. They are things in my mind that our customers actually responded to. They thought it was the food and the decor and maybe the service and the politics, but really it was the slow food values embedded in everything. That was what everyone subconsciously felt was so unique. And this is why I believe so profoundly in what I've been calling edible education. This is a slow food curriculum, if you will, that begins when children first go to school and continues with them throughout their whole academic life. I really feel that if we turn students on to these kinds of things that I'm talking about, really introduce them to slow food values when they're young, a miracle happens. A new kind of living and learning would become, as Michael Pollan says, second nature to all of them. And through them, all of us. I don't know how many of you know that I was a Montessori teacher before I opened Chez Panisse. I had seen firsthand how well Maria Montessori's methods of teaching worked. And Montessori, by the way, liked and understood food. But of course, she was Italian. Ah, uh, yes. Montessori's philosophy is based on an experiential education of the senses. See, hear, touch, taste, smell. The senses are our pathways into our minds. And I believe and I've seen that when children's senses are stimulated and opened, not only does their learning improve, but they also get a clearer perspective on the world 
and their place in it. They become inspired and empowered to create lives that are richer and deeper and more grounded and pleasurable and beautiful. It's a tried and true way of educating that first worked dramatically in the streets of Rome and then in India with children whose senses had been closed down due to poverty and the harshness of their lives. And this is very important. Today, kids' senses are closed down in similar ways, many by poverty and violence but all by their unwitting indoctrination into fast food culture. Think about it. Every single moment of their lives, they're confronted with it. On the computer, in their textbooks, in the music, in their clothes, in the advertising inside schools, with the corporate branding of their favorite sports teams and events. And with all the fast food and soft drinks concessions on every corner. Even popular television shows that are supposed to be about cooking and real food. It's inescapable. In an edible education, we shift the kids' focus by placing something better in front of them. Sense-oriented experience. And we do this by placing food and food concerns in the middle of the curriculum of the whole school. I know this sounds unusual. But eating is a central part of our daily lives and it touches every one of the slow food values. I know that in Australia, you have a very unusual scenario, as as Stephanie explained, for children bringing their own lunch from home. So it's really different uh, from the rest of the world. But bear with me for a moment while I describe a scenario as it might exist within the current school lunch system in the U.S., By integrating food in a more comprehensive way into a student's life, exposure to these values occurs naturally and democratically in the course of each day. All classes are affected and energized because they are embedded in real, living, evolving environments. Project learning gets grounded. Not only do kids start eating well, but math suddenly becomes a practical, hands-on class, taught in the lab, if you will, of the farm, garden, or kitchen classroom. A foreign language is enhanced by the translation of recipes or the performance of music from other cultures. A biology class is illuminated by the activity in the compost heap or by studying and observing chickens and insects in their natural habitats. And things like biodiversity and interconnectedness and empathy are experienced almost subconsciously as if by osmosis, just walking around a revitalized campus. The nature of the whole school begins to change. But the best news of all And on top of all these other things is that schools can create sustainable support systems beyond themselves. Like we did at Chez Panisse, they start buying organic food and supplies from local farmers and retailers and sending compost back to city parks or back to farms. They can transform their own communities and eliminate the middleman immediately. Think about it. 20% of the population goes to school. Imagine what would happen if we adopted sustainable criteria for everything we buy in the public school system. Not just food, but everything. Not only would we 
we be educating the next generation into a new, delicious way of eating and learning, but the schools themselves, the universities, would become alternative economic engines for the communities. Wouldn't it be fantastic if schools supported our communities rather than the other way around? It would be more than great. It would be revolutionary, really. It, this, what I'm talking about, isn't just gardens in schools or home economic classes or about a special environmental class or program. We're not talking about just changing the food service. We're talking about a larger, more radical approach to changing the way the face of our schools by integrating food into every aspect of academic life. And I'm not just talking about, I'm, I'm just not talking about small changes. I'm talking about a pedagogy, the philosophy behind what we teach, how we teach it, and where we teach it. I'm talking about reimagining schools from the ground up, an entire paradigm shift. That's the dangerous idea. Well, I've seen the transformation I'm talking about happen in so many places. It's been happening in the Edible Schoolyard in Berkeley for over 20 years. This is a middle school with a thousand students whose families speak 22 different languages at home. And I've watched this transformation spread to thousands of primary and secondary schools around the country and around the world and today in Australia. I've seen it happen in colleges and universities all around. Several years ago, I was asked to, to help to change the program at Yale, the food program. And we did it with slow food values in mind and the nature of the whole campus changed. I've seen this transformation occur with the inmates of the San Francisco County Jail. In fact, the, the, the prison project called the Garden Project started 30 years ago and was the original inspiration for the Edible Schoolyard Project. I thought if it could happen in jail, maybe it could happen in school. And let's help these students before they drop out and go to jail. <laughs> well, I want to point out that in each and every instance, from the little school to the big institution, it was the taste of authentic food that set in motion these shifts of awareness and behavior. The tastes and aromas and activities of growing and cooking real food is what seduced people to sit down. And once they were there, they stayed at the table and they started talking and passing the peas just the way we did at lunch today. And now I want to introduce um, the centerpiece of my dangerous idea. I believe that every school needs to have a sustainable, delicious school lunch for every child K through 12, and it has to be free, free. And I believe the Australian government, like all governments, needs to make a commitment to introducing a universal school lunch program. Although it might seem like an impossibility now, you're thinking, what would it cost and how would we build the infrastructure? and that it's a wild dream and we never had a school lunch program before. But I want you to think for a moment about the cost of not investing in a program like this. 
We're faced with dramatic challenges and we need dramatic solutions. Feeding every child in school is not only the right thing to do, but it's the only thing to do. There is always money for what is morally right. And where there is a strong national conviction, there's always a way. As Australians with a small population and wonderful agrarian traditions and and an egalitarian spirit, you have the opportunity to implement an edible education that would be a model for the rest of the world. And Stephanie Alexander has already laid the groundwork here. You know, I'm a big believer in what Gloria Steinem said several years ago. Quote, public education is our last truly democratic institution. I know she's right. Everyone goes to school or should. It's the common place in our culture where we can reach every student while they're still open and they're learning. It's the place of equity, or it should be. And I feel deep in my heart that our schools are the place where we're going to create deep and lasting change. And it is possible to make dramatic change, but we have to imagine it so we can create it. And these ideas that I'm talking about, when done with justice and with beauty, inspire people, and then everyone feels compelled to make this happen. Isn't this what Gough Whitlam did? Isn't this what he did? And now aren't pieces of his courageous agenda cornerstones of Australian life. It's time. It's time for a delicious revolution. Thank you. Wow. Alice Waters, thank you for opening such a massive can of worms here tonight. (laughs) I think you've uh, certainly generated a lot of ideas and will spark off quite a few conversations from everything you've said here tonight. But I guess the first sort of real issue that I'd like to find out about is what did Hugh Jackman say after he <laughs> visited Edible Schoolyard? Well, I, I, I'm so sad to report that I wasn't there when he came. <laughs> so sad. So sad. But I heard he had a great time. <laughs> I did hear that. But you said Jake Gyllenhaal came as well, didn't you? <laughs> yes, he did. And he actually is one of the Edible Schoolyard Uh, projects ambassadors. So when I really need to, I should have invited him here. Uh, I always, when I'm speaking and and I'm really having a hard time expressing things, there's nothing like an actor to come on stage and and take over. But he He comes from, what's great is that he comes from uh, a family that had a wonderful garden that ate together always and cooks together. And so he talks about it uh, and not as an actor, but as a real person. Yeah. It's beautiful. Okay. Do you feel like a pioneer? I mean, 
the way that you were doing things in 1971, uh, you know, you were cooking with fire, you were foraging, you were eating locally, eating organically, you know, you had one-page menus. I mean, that is certainly, in the past 10 years of reviewing restaurants in Melbourne, that is certainly the direction that it's all been happening here. Oh, I know. Um, do you, like, what was it like? Do you, did, <laughs> did you realise you were sort of doing something that would have such longevity or uh, what yeah. was it like? <laughs> tell, tell us what it was like. Well, I definitely never imagined, um, certainly never imagined that I'd be speaking to you here in Melbourne, never. Uh, I was part of what I considered the counterculture. I didn't even want to put my money from Shea Pennies into the bank because they were part of the establishment. <laughs> Did you and keep it under your in bed? In the end, we finally did. But uh, uh, it, it was a time... I, I, we were absolutely um, not interested in, you know, making money. Yeah. Uh, I mean, fortunately, we did. But that wasn't... And it never has been our first uh, interest. We, I wanted everyone to like everything that we served them. And I used to go and look at the plates and if they were, they left something on a plate, I would go out in the dining room and talk to them and ask them why. <laughs> and I'd never cook that again if they didn't like it. Yeah. I mean, I was just in a whole different um, uh, sort of mindset and I had really been empowered by the fact that, that we... It got together and stopped the war in Vietnam. And I, I have been idealistic ever since, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's great. Um, so a, a guy that I used to work with actually became a vegetarian because he was so addicted to McDonald's. And it was one of the only ways he could he could sort of get off the mackers was to become a vegetarian. Um, and so, uh, I, I guess, what would you say to some to people who, where life's time does crunch in the day, or where fast food is a bit of a, a, a part of their life? Or, I mean, what are sort of what are some slow food type strategies or tricks that you might suggest to help people? to, you know, put them into their everyday kind of life? Well, I think some things that really help are to change your habits of where you shop. Now, I would immediately go and shop at a farmer's market. Uh, I, would, I would really go to the, go to the port and yep. see the fishermen. I, I think that that just changing your habits. Yep. Um, I always, whenever I go on a plane, no matter where I'm sitting on the plane, I make my own food. Yep. I bring it with me and I, you know, I, I would, when my daughter is, is going on a trip, I, I make her a little bouquet that goes in with all the herbs, not, unlike this. And so that when she opens her lunch on the plane, she'll feel like she's at home. And it works like a charm. Yeah. It really, it does. She, she always says it helps her get from California to London. Does it uh, help with jet lag? <laughs> but one time, I, I just reminds me of a story. Uh, Ruth Reichel, who's a well-known food writer, um, came with me to a farm down in San Diego, and I decided that I was going to take the strawberries back home to serve at Chez Panisse. And so we took a big, we each took a big flat to to bring on the plane, and they just perfumed the whole plane, and we gave them all away. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the most amazing experience for people to... What is that? Yeah, it didn't come in a plastic bag. <laughs> it just was a, a big surprise. Wow, that's cool. Uh, OK, it looks like we've got a question in the dress circle in the middle there, if I've got my theatrical terms correct. Oh. That's you. Hi, Alice. My name is Alice as well. Um, oh. Firstly, I want to congratulate you on being a wonderful public speaker. You're very deliberate and slow and deliver your ideas with a lot of passion. And I felt 
moved to tears in a lot of what you were saying. Oh, that's, thank you. Uh, something that did come to mind was, I don't know how to put this politically correctly, but what is the point of someone like you talking to a group of people like us? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost preaching to the converted. Uh, well, um, my feeling is that, um, uh, that we need to gather together and focus on a, a really a, 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 a global, purposeful agenda. I think, uh, again, that fast food culture is trying to separate us and, you know, just confuse us. Um, and so uh, the more that we can gather and, and sort of really talk about these ideas, the more likely when the time comes. I mean, I feel like we're a little bit in this underground. We're in a counterculture. And, and we have to identify globally with it. We, you, you think it is shifting and changing? You, pardon me? You think that things are shifting and changing? Do you, do you, do you think that there is a little bit of movement? Well, I'm, I'm very hopeful and excited because I'm, I'm all the time talking with young people who have become farmers or opening restaurants, the people that come to Terra Madre for slow food, I'm engaged with them, and they are so articulate, they are so uncompromising, they are so hopeful. I mean, it's, it's great, and I, I know it's happening happening everywhere yeah uh, and it's happening because of the internet and because we can hear the music of yeah. of some place and and we're we're finding that uh, uh, that we're yeah there's definitely definitely demand I mean I know if we ever run a story a health related story or a, a producer type story it does traffic so well on Online, you know, I think there is a, a real demand for it, for sure. Um, okay, from the stalls down the bottom. Okay, hi, thank you. Um, I wondered if you could comment on the importance of seeds and diversity of seeds and how we can support farmers in preserving them. I can't think of anything more important, really, truly, nothing. I mean, taking care of the land is our number one obligation, number one. And so the more gardens we can plant wherever we are and uh, the idea of, of seeds and exchanging seeds, I have a gigantic bag that um, I'm carrying it. No, don't tell anybody. I'm carrying it in my suitcase. But I brought <laughs> from... An Italian farmer who would wants to give them to our farmer from Chez Panisse. And it's all the things he's been really carefully saving and that could, I think, be wonderful for the restaurant and, and wonderful for his farm. And, and it's, it's, it's something... Um, it's something we all own and it's our it's our it heritage. belongs to our heritage it belongs to humanity the seeds and everybody who's saving them should be should be uh, given great rewards <laughs> <laughs> well they are they get to eat what they've grown <laughs> um, um, question up the top hi um, I just wanted to ask, um, I've got a lot of friends who are interested in, how, you know, the sustainable food movement, slow food movement, but it, it is so slow. You know, <laughs> so slow. we try to talk to other people who aren't necessarily interested in eating stuff from the ground, making stuff yourself, just only buying things from the supermarket that's ready-made. And I just see, like, it's one-on-one -on -one so difficult to try to convert someone. How do you even get to the government level to try to say, firstly, let's put in a food program, and secondly, let's make it all healthy and all, like, organic? 
I don't even know how to, I would stop. Well, my, uh, I, I, my technique uh, is to feed people ideas, you know, feed them, bring them around a table. People, uh, for instance, in schools at the beginning of the Edible Schoolyard Project, I didn't, I, every time we had a meeting, I brought something to the table to put on the table and, uh, you know, a basket of some fruits. It's just right. And, and they, they just take a little bite and then they take another one. And what we did is we invited them to Chez Panisse to have their math class meetings and they could have lunch at the same time. Well, they really liked that. They kept wanting, and now they're asking us for more, more lunches at Chez Panisse. But they, they, they got it when they sort of sat around the table and really had a di different discussion. And I'm always thinking of ways I can gather people in Washington and, and have different, a different conversation. It's never for me, with all cooks or with all teachers. I want artists to be part of the conversation. I want people that, that, that are farmers, the people that have different ideas, and to, to uh, not have the conversation be in that same very worn political groove. It always goes the same way. I want to have a different kind of conversation. Yep. Um, what would you say, I mean, I think a lot of people do really want to eat um, organically. What You were talking before in your speech about it, you know, being cheap and that that drives you crazy when people say, it, you know, yep. about money. Um, so, I mean, I went to an organic butcher today. I bought a whole chook and probably about 400 grams of rump. It was $57, right? But this is the best. It's so delicious. You, you can taste it. But that was a very... It's quite an expensive outlay. Organic veggies aren't cheap. What do you say to people if they sort of bring up that point? Oh, they bring up that point all, all the time. time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because they have had it drummed into their minds that food should be cheap. And even the enlightened president of Yale could get around everything we were talking about, but he said, why can't it be the same price? And I, I mean, it's just there. And I, I think the way to talk about it is in terms of cooking, because I know that I can buy a chicken and serve maybe two, maybe even three meals from a chicken because I know how to make a stock, I know how to, to cut the meat, I know how to make a plate of food that's satisfying, that doesn't have an enormous, uh, you know, a quarter of a chicken on the plate. Uh, I mean, it's those kinds of things that we, you know, the grains and the, the spices. I've loved the spices all over. Yeah. Australia. I'm, in fact, I'm kind of knocked out by it. I, I never imagined that the, all the contributions from the ethnic uh, communities that, yeah. that are here uh, are making something so lively. And we, we need to share that, that knowledge we have for, for cooking very basic food for ourselves, everyday food. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, Alice? Is any other final words about how we <laughs> any can other final words? become kitchen revolutionaries <laughs> ourselves? Well, I think we have to really um, uh, use the voices of really young people. Uh, when I was uh, giving the speech at the Sydney Opera House, uh, a little kid who was 12 years old stood up and he gave a testimonial. And it was so heartfelt how important food was and why didn't his school have a garden. And you, when you heard it, you just said, we have to do something. And so let us, let us listen to children. Let us always gather with children. Let us remember that there are 
the precious future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you.